Let's bow in prayer together, shall we? Our gracious Heavenly Father, you have created us for yourself and called us to exalt your name and to show forth your glory in everything we do. Tonight, as we meet together, we do want to learn more of you and of your great and gracious love and salvation toward us. But we also do want to have our lips filled with a new song of praise. And to that end, we pray, open our eyes, help us to see more of the glory that belongs to you and our salvation. Hear us as we ask this now in Jesus' precious name. Amen. All right, tonight, chapter 28, the subject of baptism. A subject which you don't need me to tell you has been hotly disputed and uh, there's no real desire on my part to enter into that dispute and debate tonight. Would love us to be able to pursue this just with an eager understanding to appreciate more of God's goodness and grace. I appreciate that not everybody shares the same viewpoint. Uh, I just hope that what we look at tonight will stimulate us all to think, to seek, and to search out God's truth. It's helpful to begin tonight just by recapping what we looked at last week, namely a general overview of the sacraments, because that um, does establish the framework from which the Westminster Confession of Faith and from which the Reformed Confessions do... Uh, build their base. And you remember the understanding of the reformers concerning the sacraments was closely connected with their understanding of the covenant of grace. They saw the sacraments as what? Can anybody remember? Don't let's go into silent mode straight away. The reformers understood the sacraments as what? What were the terms that they used? They used, saw them as signs and seals of the covenant of grace. So they recognize that that covenant has its origins and roots in God's eternal purpose in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, something which before the foundation of the world was established in which God chose in Christ an elect people and which Christ within the counsels of the Godhead was appointed to be the redeemer, the Holy Spirit, the applier of redemption, and within that whole scheme and scope of God's gracious dealings with sinful man, it was also recognized that as God proclaimed the gospel of his grace in the world, as that great covenant of saving grace was administered in history, there should also be signs and seals connected with it that revealed the content of that covenant and confirmed it to the minds and hearts of people. So remember... A sign depicts the spiritual reality. A seal confirms the authenticity, certainty, and security of something. So that's how the Reformers viewed sacraments. They were not something additional to the gospel message. People could be saved with the gospel message. Abraham was justified when he believed God's promise. Didn't need circumcision to save him. Circumcision was added after he believed as a sign and a seal of the righteousness he had by faith. So ultimately, it is faith in the word of promise, faith in the gospel that saves people. Sacraments are added as visible signs and seals connected with the administration of God's kingdom and of God's grace community. Uh, as we'll see a little bit further tonight, there's been a sacrament in the Old Covenant connected with initiation or membership within that covenant community. There have been other sacraments that relate to ongoing remembrance and renewal. In the Old Testament, the Passover, the New Testament, the Lord's Supper. But fundamentally, we're talking about the gospel God's grace being administered in old and new covenants and having in the old covenant visible signs and seals associated with it and in the new covenant also signs and seals. So have you got that? When uh, <clears throat> Michael and Adele made their promises to each other, when Shed and uh, Louise made their promises to each other recently, they gave each other wedding rings as an outward physical token demonstration of the covenant uh, 
the promise and the pledge. I uh, was speaking with a Pakistani friend the other day, and he said to me, ha ha, no wedding ring. And uh, I said, no, I, I haven't. He says, I don't have one either. And I said, well, I grew up in a farming community where for generations men had not worn wedding rings. And I was a dirt scientist as well, a soil scientist, so I constantly had my hands in the mud. And so a combination of culture, uh, history, and practicality at that time, you know, men didn't wear rings, but I, uh, I was just sharing with them how even a fortnight ago after she and Louise's wedding, Nola snuggled up to me in bed at night and said, you know what, every time I go to a wedding today and I see the man also wearing a wedding ring, I wish you wore a wedding ring. <laughs> and I said to her, I said to her, dear, if I was getting married today, I would wear a wedding ring. She says, oh, that's all I needed to hear. <laughs> Point I'm making is, oh, well, that, that's right. I sometimes wonder if uh, perhaps on a wedding anniversary, I might just give her a little box and say, well, dear, here it is all these years. <laughs> But the point I'm making is the, the fact that I don't wear a wedding ring doesn't mean to say that I am not in covenant, a covenant commitment of marriage. The visible symbol that we come to associate with that isn't there, but the commitment's there, the reality of being joined in covenant marriage is there. And similarly, faith in the promises and the gospel of God saves and is real. And in a sense... From one point of view, the visible symbols were not necessarily needed for there to be justifying faith. But as we'll see tonight, God in his earthly administration of his kingdom doesn't just consider the visible tokens as something you can take or leave if you've got a soil scientist occupation or not. Uh, they are very important for God. They're very precious. Not ultimately necessary unto salvation, but not to be despised and dismissed either. So, Catherine, maybe I will wear that wedding ring yet, just as a... It's on tape. Oh, it's on tape. Well, never, never mind. Mum won't mind. So, uh, here we are. We're talking tonight, then, about signs and seals of a covenant. God establishes a covenant... God administers that covenant and connection with that covenant. He also gives signs and seals. On his part, he's the one who gives the wedding ring. That's the way we understand it. He says, you put it on. You put it on. Interestingly, when he gave Noah uh, the uh, sign of the rainbow in the ninth chapter of Genesis, you remember it's not Noah when you look upon that, but rather when he, God, looks upon it. He will remember. Uh, anyway, it's a marvelous thing, this whole idea of gracious signs and seals to confirm God's gospel. That's what we're talking about. So we come tonight to baptism, which, as we see, is the sign of initiation. And in our study, as our notes or the synopsis points out, there are four main sections. There are in, in total, you'll find that there are seven articles in this 28th chapter, but I've summarized them in four main sections. They can be described as the nature and purpose of baptism, the administration of baptism, baptism and saving grace, and the frequency of baptism. So that's what we look at tonight. So to begin with, let's have a look at the nature or the meaning and the purpose of baptism. And again, I hope we know, accept, love and trust one another enough to know we can talk about these things without feeling any tension. It is really quite important when we begin to talk about baptism to make sure we talk about the meaning of baptism, the nature or the meaning of baptism, because right at that level there are differences of understanding. So we'll begin and see what the Confession of Faith says. It says, baptism is a sacrament of the New Testament or the New Covenant appointed by Jesus Christ. You might remember when we talked about sacraments and talked about the number of sacraments last week. We noted that it really is only the authoritative voice of God that can invest a sacrament with efficacy and blessing. 
people, remember I said last week you might decide that to have a cup of water with a daisy in it is a good symbol of perseverance. But because God has not invested that sign with that significant, we can't rely on the cup of water with a daisy in it as a means of grace and blessing. Only his word can set something apart as a grace-bearing symbol and sign and seal of his saving grace. So here we have baptism being appointed by Jesus Christ. And we've got here, not only for the solemn admission of the person baptized into the visible church or the community of believers, but also to be for him a sign and seal of the covenant of grace, his being engrafted into Christ of regeneration, of remission of sins, and of his yielding himself to God through Jesus Christ to walk in newness of life. So here we've got a statement, to begin with a reasonably full statement, of the nature of baptism or the meaning of baptism up here. Let's have a look at our notes, follow this through. This section teaches A, that baptism is a sacrament of the new covenant or New Testament ordained by the Lord Jesus Christ. Baptism is a sacrament of the new covenant, a sign or seal of a spiritual reality. It does not in itself save a person, but it does represent and confirms truths of salvation. It is a figure of that which does save. All right, I think we're happy enough with that from last week to see that sacraments do not in themselves convey grace, but they are certainly signs and seals and channels of grace. Second point, it was ordained by the Lord Jesus Christ. Our Lord instituted it by positive command in the gospel. Perhaps it's worthwhile just pausing at this point. Do you think that the whole concept and notion of baptism already existed before Jesus' ministry. Did it? Did it? Who else baptized before Jesus came? John the Baptist baptized with a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. There's a couple of interesting passages in the New Testament. We'll come to them a little bit later perhaps, but one in Luke and one in Mark where the term baptism particularly the one in Mark, Mark chapter 7. In fact, why don't we turn to there right now? There's a little interesting use of the word baptism in Mark chapter 7. Hamish preached on this passage last week. And in the third verse of Mark 7, this is a passage concerning the Pharisees having an argument with Jesus' disciples or Jesus over the fact his disciples ate with unwashed hands. And the Pharisees asked him why the disciples ate with unclean or unwashed hands. And you note in verse 3, the NIV says this, The Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing, holding to the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. Now here it is. And they observe many other traditions, such as the washing of cups pitchers, and kettles. Now that word washing there is baptism. That is the word Mark uses in the Greek. Baptizo. They baptize cups, pitchers, and kettles. The older translations also have couches. Here we are. What have we got? A marginal note here for the NIV. Some early manuscripts pitchers, kettles, and dining couches. Well, there it is. Baptism evidently was a term that was connected with ceremonial washing and cleansing. It existed beforehand, but the Lord Jesus Christ, nevertheless, by an express word of sanction, express word of command, commanded his disciples to baptize disciples in his name, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So here it is. It is an ordinance, a new covenant ordinance appointed by Jesus Christ. John baptized before, baptism of repentance for the remission of sins, but Jesus ordained that the disciples should baptize his disciples. So we can say it's a sacrament of the New Testament appointed by Jesus. 
Jesus Christ. Any problems with that? Right. Let's move on to this second part here. This relates to its purpose. Up here we've got its origin. Here its purpose. Now, you note that it's two broad groups of purposes here. One, admission into the church. And two, a sign and seal of those various things. Back at our notes, we've got this. Baptism was intended both as a mark of admission of a person into the visible church and as a sign and seal of the benefits of the covenant of grace. That's how the confession of faith understands it. Now in the New Testament, baptism does stand, does it not, at the very verge of people being included in the covenant community. You don't encounter, for example, Peter preaching to a great crowd on the day of Pentecost and say, when they ask, what must we do to be saved effectively, or men and brethren, what must we do? Peter doesn't say, well, what you need to do is repent, and then you need to live a blameless Christian life for 15 years, and then just 10 years before you're due to die, I want you to be baptized, or just an hour or two before you die, I want you to be baptized. No, no. Right at the very beginning, those two things go together, repentance and baptism, believing, repenting and obeying. They belong right at the very, very inception or beginning of connection with the new covenant community. We'll talk a little bit later about the validity or otherwise of children being involved. But in this New Testament situation that we encounter in the scriptures, we're talking about the first generation of believers. You're talking about the first generation of Jews who embrace Jesus as the Messiah and are included within the new covenant community. First generation of Gentiles who believe. And as far as they're concerned, baptism occurs at the threshold. Go make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Baptism's always connected with initiation into the covenant community. Any problems with that? Do you think that that's true, generally speaking? Well, universally speaking. Okay, so here we have, baptism does have a function of marking a person out as being associated with the visible church. Just as in the Old Testament, circumcision was a visible emblem that a person belonged to the descendants or the household of Israel. So baptism does serve as a demarcation ordinance separating people who follow Christ from people who don't. Some of you will have talked with folk from Muslim cultures. We have Russell here who's lived and worked amongst Muslim people. And they will tell you that in many, many instances anyway, Muslims who actually um, believe in Jesus as the Messiah are not necessarily excluded immediately by their families. But the moment a professing believer is baptized, that is a different thing. The families immediately recognize that that outward ordinance of baptism is indeed a very visible expression of farewelling a past and shifting one's commitment, loyalty, and belief to a whole new, not only religious system, but a whole new community and family of faith. Is that right, Russell? Yes. That, uh, right. Somebody was telling me that even just last week again they were making that point. So baptism does serve, particularly in missionary situations and cultures, without a doubt that a person's serious. Even today, you could a person is brought up in a non-Christian community out here. They may start attending worship and start attending church and start singing and talking Christian jargon. And say, whoa, that's, that's just pretty good. They're coming on board. Um, but there's still something different when a person does ask to be baptized. And in that way, visibly identified with Christ and with the community of his people. It is a radical line that people step over. And from that point of view, it does have that effect of 
marking people as members of the visible church. So that's one of the roles, one of the functions, one of the things that baptism does. Marks you out as a member of the visible church. Now, okay, it has that effect, but is that all? Uh, from one point of view, you could say, well, the Lord could have instituted several things that actually marked a person out. You could have just got a particular haircut. And that marked you out as a member of the church or a tattoo or something like that. But no, no, it is this particular ordinance that he has chosen to be the initiatory ordinance for the visible church and for participation in the new covenant community. Is it incidental, do you think, that he appointed an ordinance that had a washing character about it? I don't think so. Not in terms or not in view of, in particular, the way in which, as I said last week in the scriptures, there is a whole sign theology where God not only gives promises, but he gives some visible symptoms and symbols. When it came, for example, to prefiguring the atoning death of Jesus, he didn't tell people just to go and bake a loaf of bread and eat it but rather he chose a symbol that did reflect in a very real way the shedding of blood and the giving of life to make an atonement for sin. So there's a whole history in the scriptures of covenantal sign that does reflect something of the character of the spiritual truth that's being sealed and represented. Follow what I'm talking about? So... Here, the appointment of baptism as a sign is not a random thing. Jesus didn't, as it were, on the moment as he stood there on that mount, say, go make disciples of all nations, and then, I'm saying this reverently and not blasphemy, I didn't think Jesus for a moment paused and he thought, no, what can I have as a, as a good sign, a good symbol of people associated? Oh, yes, that's what, go and baptize them. I don't think Jesus had to think about that. I think that all through the Old Covenant, and as he grew up studying that Old Covenant scripture, he was well aware of the laver of water in the tabernacle furnishings and in the temple. He well knew of the whole idea of uh, the washing and cleansing of the priests before they put their garments on, the washing and cleansing of defiled people after they'd been through a ceremonial cleansing rite. He was well and truly acquainted with all those things that pointed forward to the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit that was going to be connected with the covenantal blessings connected with himself. So he, as the one who saw and understood all the Old Testament types and shadows concerning himself, he didn't have to think around and say, well, what can I have as an ordinance? He knew he was fulfilling all those cleansing rites. Therefore, when it came to an initiatory sign or a sign that was to be administered to those who were his disciples, he instinctively, do I say, intuitively, automatically, significantly, uh, meaningfully said, baptize. Baptize. It was fitting that there shouldn't be the sprinkling of blood or at least some kind of action that required bloodletting. You see, if you've got to use blood again, there's got to be some bloodletting procedure go on. Doesn't that make sense? If you're going to sprinkle people with blood, theoretically, I suppose, you could have sprinkled blood upon people to be his disciples because the sprinkling of the blood of the covenant... But if it was to be the sprinkling of blood, it would have had to be somebody else's blood. Is that right? It would have had to be an animal's blood or some other person's blood. But there's only one blood that does fulfill the, the, the covenantal requirements. That's the blood of Jesus. So it was fitting that there should be water applied in whatever way, and we'll talk about that later on, as a symbol that indicated that through union with Jesus Christ and participation in him, the person concerns cleansed. All right? So what I'm getting at here is this. 
That sign Jesus chose is not simply an external badge like a particular suit of clothes that you wear to indicate that you're all part of a particular gang. I was saying at chapel this morning, I received an email yesterday from a friend, a former student who'd been along to a, a destiny party political rally. And all the candidates apparently appeared in matching black and red suits, except one who had black and blue, just being a little bit out of the order. But here you've got a kind of uniform now for a political representation and party. Now, Jesus could have said, well, I want my disciples to wear something like that, but it's more than outward, more than just an outward badge. It's to be a sign and seal also. Okay, so not only something that marks us out as belonging to the visible church, but also intended to be a sign and seal of the covenant of grace. And here we've got these various things that do relate to this, of being engrafted into Christ, of regeneration, of remission of sins, and of his yielding himself to God through Jesus Christ to walk in newness of life. Now, <clears throat> these things are really quite important. Over to page two on your notes here, and there's a number of things here. We're going to take a few moments again to work through this. And I hope it is of value to you as we <clears throat> go through this. Now, what have we got here? Right at the bottom of page one, I've got this. Sign and seal of the benefits of the covenant of grace. It's sign and seal of the covenant of grace, page two. Notice this. Too often baptism is seen in its connection, no, sorry, is not seen in its connection with the great saving purposes of God set forth in the scriptures. Now, please, I don't want to be critical of anything again here, but is it not true that Sometimes we can view baptism as simply a formal ordinance uh, that's become somewhat ritualized. Now, certainly in Pedro Baptist communions, particularly, and I'm not again meaning to be offensive, but both in Presbyterian and in Anglican backgrounds in particular, child baptism came to be known as what? Christening, and more than anything, was associated with a name-giving ceremony. And so, in a real sense, parents used to speak about having their kids done. And you would go along, have your kids done, and they would be christened and named. And in a sense, you see, that whole ordinance of christening or baptism of children came to exist by itself effectively as a traditional, a religious traditional naming ceremony that didn't really have any significance with the bigger drama of salvation. Whereas what the Confession of Faith, what this particular note is saying is, look, baptism, the ordinance of baptism cannot be considered apart from or understood significantly apart from the gospel of salvation. And that's what we need to understand here. Look at the quotation here from Tom Wilkinson. He says, Baptism cannot be analyzed or explained as though it was self-contained, but it is illuminated by its relations to God's great promises in the covenant of grace. Now, I've mentioned about the way in which Peter Baptist churches can, in a sense, shrink the significance of baptism to an isolated ceremony and event. Now, that is also true of Baptist churches. It can come simply to have the significance and the force effectively of a, an outward sign testifying to your faith in Christ. And so once again, it becomes an initiatory activity, but it still can be a relatively isolated event. I've been baptized. I have borne witness to the fact that I'm a follower of Jesus. And so in a sense, it's got a slightly different meaning to the christening context. It does have a different meaning, but it's still quite isolated. Whereas if we're to understand the fuller theological significance of baptism, whether we come from a Baptistic perspective or from a Pado baptist perspective, we need to realize that it's connected with something much bigger than simply our personal testimony of believing or naming a child. 
It is, in fact, connected with God's great covenantal redemption of his people. And so its meaning is to be understood in terms of the gospel, in terms of salvation from that point of view. And what have we got here? The first, in terms of significance here, in terms of it's a sign and seal of what? what? What's the theological gospel significance? The first point the Confession of Faith mentions here is it is a sign and seal of his being engrafted into Christ. Now, in the, uh, in the New Testament, you'll find baptism quite frequently, or at least quite significantly mentioned in connection with union with Christ. Romans chapter 6, verse 3 is a classic passage. Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ, Jesus, were baptized into his death? Now, that's one verse that points very, very distinctly to baptism being connected with union with Christ. Don't you know that as many of you as were baptized into Christ, Christ. It has the notion of being united to Christ. Baptized, baptism in some sense or other being connected with union with Christ. You have a similar thing in Galatians chapter 3, the verse, perhaps I mightn't, uh, here we are. Galatians 3 verse 27. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. Now, there's a couple of mentions or references to baptism being intimately connected with Christ and being baptized into Christ, signifying union with Christ. Does that make sense to you? Does that seem to be what's being referred to there? Let me stand back from that a little bit and just, just uh, tease this out. I... I uh, I'm not wanting to delay, but I'm wanting to help you see this. Do you think that baptism per se necessarily is connected with union with a person? Uh, when, for example, John came baptizing for the remission of sins, was his baptism, could you say that John's baptism was baptizing people into himself. No. I don't think we can even say it was consciously baptizing people into Jesus. In Acts chapter 19, there's a differentiation made between John's baptism and Jesus' baptism. I think John's baptism was simply a baptism that did symbolize remission of sins and forgiveness. So, in a sense, baptism per se in itself, I don't think, unites to a person. But Professor John Murray, in his discussion of Christian baptism and in discussing baptism, says, what was it that was so unique and special about the baptism that Jesus initiated and ordained in that great commission. How did it differ from John's? And he underscores the fact that John's baptism was a baptism for the remission of sins, a baptism of repentance unto the remission of sins. But Jesus, when Jesus gave that command, you notice the words again, what were his words? Baptize in or in the Greek, that preposition is ace, E-I-S, which is commonly and perhaps more commonly translated into. Baptize into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Now that is so, so important when we consider baptism. Baptism is not just an ordinance out there. There is a distinctive character about Christian baptism, and the distinctive character about it is it is a baptism in or into the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 
It is a baptism, in other words, that does, on the one hand, speak of all the cleansing elements, which we'll look at in a moment, but above that, it is a baptism that identifies and connects and expresses the belonging to the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Why don't we look just at another couple of references in this regard in the New Testament. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 is a, an interesting, very, very similar experience, uh, expression here. <clears throat> in 1 Corinthians 10, Paul is still dealing with the general subject of eating and drinking food and drink that's been offered to idols. And the struggle those early Christians had in pagan cultures and knowing what they could and couldn't do in connection with idolatrous worship and more particularly in connection with animals that had been sacrificed in idolatrous worship. And Paul's warning very definitely against them participating in anything of an idolatrous character. And he says, verse 1 of chapter 10, I don't want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers, that our forefathers were all under the cloud and that they all passed through the sea. Now, what do you think he means by that is? I don't want you to be ignorant of the fact that they were included in that great redemptive salvation event of the Old Testament. They all passed through the sea and they were all under the cloud. That is, they were all shaded and shadowed by God's protective presence. They were all embraced by Yahweh as he brought them up out of Egypt. So they were all outwardly anyway identified with his people. And in verse 2 he says, They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food. They drank the same spiritual drink. They drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them. That rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered over the desert. Now, basically what he's wanting to do there is warn them and say, our fathers all experienced incredible redemptive and covenantal blessings in the exodus out of Egypt. And yet, because of their unbelief and rebellion, most of them perished in the sea. He's effectively saying to them, you cannot count upon outward participation or participation in outward privilege for covenantal blessings and ultimate salvation. Many of those people, he said, perished in the desert. And he's wanting to warn the Corinthians, you may have outwardly taken a stand apart from idolatry. You may even be baptized. You may even be separated from uh, idolatry in your lifestyle. But if you engage in idolatry, etc., and he goes on to warn them. So that's the whole context of that. But note, sandwiched in the midst of those covenantal blessings experienced by Israel and the Israelites is they were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. In some sense or other, what Paul is saying is those great redemptive events connected and united and identified the people with Moses. When they were in Egypt, they were under the tyranny, the rule, and the domination of the Egyptians. Coming out of Egypt, being attached to Moses, following Moses, going through the sea with Moses, the great mediator of God's salvation event, they were baptized into him, they were connected with him, they united with him, they were identified with him. And that's the same kind of sense that Jesus means when he says, you baptize them into the name of the Father, Son, and of the Holy Spirit. He's saying, baptize them. Baptize them into that name, which means mark them out, identify them. You, they are affected. It's an outward symbol of being united with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in his redemptive purposes. So, First and foremostly, that whole concept of being baptized into the name 
of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, or as in some parts, baptized in or into the name of Christ, symbolizes our union, identification with the triune God, our being engrafted into Christ. Okay? That is one concept of baptism. It is not just my display of what's happened to me. It is an outward token and symbol which done in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit reflects an engrafting into Christ and a union with the triune God. Now, any, any questions about that? Can you, can you see the point I'm trying to make there? Baptism is not just a remote, isolated event that takes place once and has no continuing significance because it's in or into the name of it symbolizes a union and an association with the triune God. Okay? Right. Now, a second thing here is it's also a symbol of regeneration and of the remission of sins. Now, <clears throat> I mentioned last week did I mention last week about that whole idea of being born again of, the, of water and the Spirit? And the, did I mention that about Nicodemus and being born again? Did I not mention that? I didn't. Okay. Maybe turn back to John 3 just for a moment. In that well-known passage in John 3, Jesus' discussion with Nicodemus, he says to Nicodemus, when Nicodemus comes to him by night, Nicodemus Except a man's born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Remember that? Nicodemus comes. Master, is your te rabbi, teacher. He says, we know that you're a prophet or you're a teacher sent from God because no man can do these wonderful things you're doing unless God's with him. And Jesus immediately responds, truly, verily, amen. I say to you, unless a man's born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus was representative of a sect, if you like, or a group within Israel that believed that observance of the law would guarantee participation in the eternal kingdom of God. Jesus says, Nicodemus, let me tell you right at the outset. You cannot simply by pursuing wisdom as a good scholar and teacher really see and understand the mysteries of the kingdom. You certainly can't enter the kingdom simply by rational pursuit. Something else got to happen, Nicodemus. You've got to be born from above. Born again, there's got to be something new, radical happen. Nicodemus, of course, is perplexed by this. And he says, how can a man be born when he is old? Nicodemus asked, surely he cannot enter a second time to his mother's womb to be born. Nicodemus was evidently still thinking of this rebirth or new birth or birth from above in physical terms. But Jesus answered this by way of explanation. He adds this, I tell you the truth. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. Now, that's tremendously significant. Jesus effectively saying, look, the very best that flesh can bring forth is flesh. Human nature gives birth to human nature, and there's nothing that it can do beyond that. And what is more, sinful fallen human nation, nature can do nothing but bring forth sinful fallen human nature. Whereas... That spiritual insight, spiritual perception, spiritual uh, fittedness for the eternal kingdom can only be brought about by a spiritual birth. Got to be something happened to us, a rebirth by the Holy Spirit before people can enter the kingdom. Got to be two births. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. There does have to be a birth from above. Now, the point I'm making is this. Notice that Jesus, when he first elaborates on this, says, unless a man is born of water and the Spirit. Many people think that Jesus is here alluding to baptism, born through 
baptism. That's probably not what he's referring to, really, that John's baptism or Christian baptism. Christian baptism hadn't been instituted at this particular point in time. What is much more likely is that Jesus is alluding to Ezekiel 36, and uh, those verses were, <clears throat> perhaps I mentioned this last, I can't remember where I've mentioned this last, but I know I have. Verse 25 of Ezekiel 36, where God's speaking of the blessings of the new covenant era, says, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Now, notice how in those particular verses, what Jesus is predicting is he's essentially going to, or what, what the prophet, what God's predicting through the prophet is going to do two things. He's going to sprinkle them with water and they're going to be clean. He is going to purify them. That cleansing has the idea of washing away of their defilement. I was doing a bit of weeding in the garden the other day. Inevitable when you're weeding in the garden, you've got flowers there, and there's not that many flowers in our garden, but there were nevertheless some that you get a bit of soil and light, friable, composty stuff sprinkled over the leaves. And what once was a quite pretty petunia now becomes a kind of speckled petunia. But the rains come down since, believe it or not, there's rain occasionally up here in Auckland, and the rains come down and all of that surface splotching has been cleansed away. And God is anticipating a time when he is going to wash and purify the sins of people away. So that's one dimension of what he was prophesying through Ezekiel, the idea of cleansing and remitting, this washing away and remitting of sins, no longer holding them against us in any way at all. But then in Ezekiel, you remember, God says something more. He says he's going to address the problem, what? Of a hard heart. I will put my spirit in them. I will take away the stony heart and make it a fleshly heart that will now respond to my commandments. Now, it is important to see that in God's renewing work of grace, which he does by the Holy Spirit, there are those two things that happen. There is the regenerating of the inner man, the opening of the eyes of the mind and heart. There is the softening of the will, the quickening of the affections and purifying of the affections so that the inner man is given a new bent, a new capacity, not perfected, but nevertheless there is an impulse toward right that's put there right in the depths of the heart. And there's a softness of heart there and a hunger and a thirst for God. That's done. But there's also this cleansing and washing. Now, the best commentators and theologians that I've been able to read and study in connection with John 3 highlight the fact that when Jesus said, you've got to be born from above, unless you're born of water and of the Spirit, he's not necessarily talking about two rebirths, one through baptism and one through spirit baptism. There's only one birth in view, one new birth, but it does have these two dimensions to it. It has the dimension of cleansing, the washing away and the remitting of all our sins. And it also does have that dimension of renewing the heart, softening, transforming, and regenerating. Now, coming back to this, the framers of the Confession of Faith pick up on this and they say, when we are baptized into Jesus Christ, our baptism, Firstly, signifies our union with Christ because it's a baptism into the name of Christ and into the name of the Father and into the name of the Son. Union with Him. But then connected with that, it also symbolizes this washing with water and this cleansing and making new. 
symbolizes the new birth. It symbolizes cleansing. It symbolizes regeneration. That make sense? And the fourth thing we've got here as well, our being baptized symbolizes also this complete defilement and, uh, sorry, this complete break and cleansing with an old life of the flesh, of sin, and of self-pleasing. And correspondingly, it, it emphasizes and, uh, and conveys the idea of yielding ourselves to God through Jesus Christ to walk in newness of life. That idea is particularly picked up in the Romans 6 passage where the apostle says, look, he's addressing that issue and question of shall we continue to sin that grace may abound? And he says, God forbid, by no means, verse 2, we died to sin, how can we live any longer in it? Or don't you know that all of us were baptized who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore baptized into him through baptism, sorry, also buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Now, again, please, I, I don't want to confuse you. I don't want to make too many things here. One of the most critical things I think we need to remember about baptism is it is baptism does signify union with Christ. It really does. Baptized into him and into his name. That union with Christ symbolizes then union with him and everything that he has done in terms of his, it, it symbolizes our union with him and his perfect righteousness, but especially in his death, in his burial, and in his resurrection to live under God. So if we are united to him, and if our baptism is a way of saying, look, that is a complete cleansing and a separation from all that is sinful and defiled and all that belongs to the old order of things, it is a newness. It symbolizes rebirth. It symbolizes washing and renewal connected with life in Christ. That life in Christ is also a life unto God. Isn't that right? Jesus rose to live unto God. If we are united to Jesus, we have been raised with him and identified with him too, to live unto God. And that's behind this understanding here. You see an adult baptized today. What we are to see in that is not only a symbol that's marking them out as being a member of the visible church, and does do that, but it is also an outward sign that indicates that these people are graphically united with Christ and united with him and all the benefits of his salvation. And specifically as we look at that water, whether it's applied in the way of sprinkling or pouring or people are immersed into that, the whole concept to be associated with that is cleansing, renewal, rebirth, remaking, it symbolizes the regenerative newness connected with union in Jesus and being baptized into him through the Holy Spirit. Is that all right? Comments, questions? That's the kind of fuller, richer understanding Right? Well, look, last little thing we just got down here. and that, that's, that's its origin. This is its purpose. Here is just a statement about its permanence. The sacrament is by Christ's own appointment to be continued in his church until the end of the world. <clears throat> Did Christ actually... Well, no, no, I won't ask that question. In the Great Commission where Jesus does command that baptism should be administered, it's in a context of him being preached everywhere and for all time, is it not? Go make disciples, what, of all nations? So was this just something for the Jews? No, not just for the Jews. And he ends up by saying, and lo, I am with you how long? 
always, even unto the end of the age. So this ordinance of baptism was evidently meant to be administered to all disciples in every place who call on his name until the end of the age. So until he comes back again, those who belong to the new covenant community, those who are part of the visible church, are to be baptized. And this is something of its rich significance and meaning. Any comments? Questions? All right, let's take a break. And we'll come back and look at areas of the administration of it, its efficacy, and so on. Surviving all right, Davi? Of course you are. Good, good, good. All right, well, look, let's pick up where we left off. This next section looks at the administration of baptism. And this particular section I've got summarized up here does embrace three of the articles in the Confession. Articles 2, 3, and 4 are all embraced in this one. So what have we got? We've got the manner and the mode and the subjects. And uh, this is the one in which we do get into some more disputable issues and areas, but let's go through. Firstly, having a look at the manner. The confession begins by saying, the outward element to be used in the sacrament is water. And you say, well, of course, nobody disputes that. What are you talking about? Well, if you have a look at your notes on page 3, under A.1, <coughs> you'll find a citation here from John McPherson, who, under this area of the material element to be used in baptism as water, says this, only water is recognized as the element to be used. <clears throat> Besides this, in the Romish church, an elaborate ceremonial was introduced comprising the sign of the cross, salt, touching ear and nose with spittle, anointing with oil, dressing in a white robe, and carrying a burning torch. All these as unordained, whatever their symbolic suitability, must be regarded as at least unessential to the admission of the sacrament. Well, he's been very kind. At the least unessential, at worst, he could have probably added downright superstitious clutter that uh, gets in the road. In the United States, there was a debate between the Southern and Northern Presbyterian churches in the 19th century when they separated and distinguished as separate bodies. The Northern Church recognized Roman Catholic baptism, but the Southern Church under Dabney and Thornwell and others didn't. And in James Henley Thornwell's discussions on Popish baptism, or as he calls it, or Roman Catholic baptism, one of the reasons for not accepting Roman Catholic baptism in the Southern Church was that they did uh, pervert even the elements of baptism, uh, namely mingling sacred oil or having consecrated water, and <clears throat> in that regard, introducing elements of superstition into the very practice of the rite. So this is really why this is stated up here. The Outward element to be used in the sacrament is water. <clears throat> Speaking of that, I didn't get time for a drink, and my throat's not so great, so I uh, might just pour myself <coughs> some of this poor man's whiskey, which is simply distilled water. It is distilled. It goes through a still, but it doesn't have anything other than pure water in it. Catherine will vouch for that, won't you, dear? You think so? <laughs> anyway, well... <laughs> yes, well, I have to be careful. You see, we do have a still in the garage, but uh, it is just a, a water still. Anyway, carry on. Water. Yeah, well, that's true. 
the outward element to be used in the sacrament is water. Now, here we go. With which the person is to be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit by a minister of the gospel who's been lawfully called to the ministry. Now, this part here, we'll just uh, refer back to what I said last week, the insistence and the tying of the administration of the sacraments to lawfully ordained ministers has had a twofold basis. Number one, the sacrament only has meaning in connection with the word. Even as tonight, as I've sought to explain the significance of baptism, as Reformed churches understand it, um, you see that it's quite different to the superstitious notion that a few drops of water sprinkled on somebody does regenerate the soul. And if you leave the sacrament without the ministry of the word, you are inclined to get all sorts of superstitious rites and understandings connected with it. So historically, it's been recognized the proper administration and benefit of the sacraments requires the ministry of the word, and therefore it's properly administered by a minister of the word. And the second idea, as I mentioned last week, was it's not a private ordinance, but rather a, an ordinance belonging to the church, per se, and properly to be administered by a representative of the church. So that's this part here. And I've mentioned the fact that it is baptism into the triune God. Uh, although in the New Testament, the emphasis often tends to be upon union with Christ. Nevertheless, we must remember that our redemption and our salvation is truly Trinitarian. It has its roots in the Father's electing covenantal design and purpose and love in eternity and the Son's achieving of that saving plan of God and of the Holy Spirit's application. One God, three persons, baptized into one is baptized into all. It is a triune God who effects our salvation and into whose name we are baptized. We are children of the Father. We are members of Christ the Son. We are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. And it's fitting that that baptismal formula should uh, symbolize our union and participation with the three members of the Godhead. All right, so that is the manner. It involves water, and it is a matter of being baptized into or in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. That's the fundamental essence and center point of baptism. Now, in terms of mode, I just want to check here. We can move straight on now to looking at mode. Dipping the person into the water is not necessary but baptism is rightly administered by pouring or sprinkling water upon the person. Now, in essence, and I think we'll find in this a statement that says that the confession of faith takes a moderate position here. What is it? Ooh, we'll perhaps come to it later on. The confession of faith is worded in this way to counter the strong Anabaptist position that the only legitimate mode of administering baptism is dipping people into the water. And I'm sure you're aware of the fact that it's characteristic of the Baptist position that baptism is only rightly administered through uh, immersion in water. And anything less than that is not <coughs> baptism. So... The Baptistic or Anabaptistic position is that dipping is essential or it is necessary for a valid baptism. The framers of the Confession of Faith don't deny that baptism can be by dipping, but they nevertheless say it is not necessary and add that it is also rightly administered by pouring and sprinkling of water upon the person. Perhaps we can just take... Uh, have a look through our notes here and pick up one or two things just as we go through this again. <clears throat> so under B, point one, okay, page three, we're looking at B, point one, there are three acceptable modes of administering baptism. 
dipping a person into the water is not necessary. The confession of faith takes a moderate view on the way baptism is to be performed. Some denominations insist on a single proper method. The confession of faith argues that while water is to be the medium, the mode of baptism is not fixed. Arguments for immersion only are not definitive or compelling. This is uh, the position we hold to as Reformed Presbyterians. Claims that the Greek words are always used in the sense of immersion cannot be substantiated. G.O. Williamson makes this point. The fact that the word baptizo does not mean... Or sorry, the fact is that the word baptizo does not mean immersion. The... Uh, there's got to be a distinction in our minds between uh, baptism and the act of baptism. Uh, to baptize with suffering, for example, uh, does not really have reference to a particular physical mode of any action. It's simply a term to be baptized into means to be brought into union with suffering or to experience suffering, or have suffering come upon us, or be plunged into suffering, or something or other. The, the word baptized doesn't per se in itself demand a mode of definition for its meaning. It doesn't mean that. This is what Williamson's saying. The fact is, the fact is that the word does not mean immersion. This is not to say that the term cannot legitimately be applied to an action involving immersion, okay? You can use the term baptism to, re to refer to a, an act of immersing people in water, but it's a question of whether baptism actually means immersion. It is only that the term doesn't have that precise meaning. Well, I've alluded to Luke or Matthew 7, 1 to 3, there are instances where this claim cannot be established. The method of washing hands, for example, excludes immersion, for washing was by pouring water into each cupped hand and allowing it to pass through the fingers so as to reach all parts of the hand. Pausing for a moment there, it is fairly well established that in washing rituals in the Old Covenant and the Old Testament, the idea of simply plunging, and certainly repeated plunging of soiled hands into a still body of water, did not have the idea of cleansing. You can understand why. You've only got to be shearing. And we, I remember when we were shearing, we used to have an old aluminium basin and that always used to be put uh, outside the house before you came in to have your lunch. And there was a towel and a soap there, and you, the first person that washed their hands, <laughs> and that got a good deal. But by the time you were the sixth person, uh, that water was foul. And you wouldn't, for a moment, certainly use that as symbolic of cleansing. Running water was generally used, even if it was running water scooped up and poured or dropped over something. But the notion of putting yourself in repeatedly the same re receptacle of still water was not a good image of cleansing and washing rites in the Old Testament. And that's a particular point here. The method of washing hands and of, generally speaking, the cleansing rituals in the Old Testament tended to be taking water and running them over or pouring over. All right, we just carry on here just looking at some of these other arguments that are brought forth by Presbyterian Reformed people. The forgiveness of sins that baptism signifies is often represented in the Old Testament rituals by the figure of sprinkling. In the New Testament, it is said that we have come to the sprinkling of blood that speaks more graciously than the blood of Abel. Certainly in that Old Testament uh, ritual of, of, of blood and the blood of covenant being poured out upon people, there was a sprinkling mode or action involved there. Furthermore, baptism with the Holy Spirit is connected with the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. Now, I appreciate that you may not be that convinced by these kind of things, but...
This is the, the, the basis of Pedro commun or Pedro Baptist, sorry, the Pedro Baptist argument for mode. The fundamental, the simple argument goes like this: water is fundamentally used to symbolize cleansing. In Jewish ritual and tradition, cleansing is characteristically by having water applied to a cup, rather than subjects being plunged into water. And certainly not plunged into still water, because repeated plunging of two, three, four, five, six people into still water would be viewed as potentially defiling rather than cleansing. So the Peter Baptist has basically said water is the crucial thing. Purification or cleansing is the essential symbolism connected with water being used in baptism. And the most appropriate way to symbolize that is by pouring water upon or sprinkling water upon and that kind of notion of being baptized with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit from above, likewise, best adapts to that kind of mode. It's characteristic for Baptist folk to say <clears throat> the argument from Romans 6, 1 to 4 is definitive and demands immersion. Remember Romans 6, 1 to 4 says, don't you realize that as many of you as were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death or into his burial and were consequently or subsequently raised with him. And the argument is this. Going down into the water is a symbol of our burial with Christ. Coming up out of the water symbolizes our resurrection with Christ. Now, I have no problems with the fact that that may be and that is illustrative or could be taken as symbolic of those things. However, what have we got here? The argument that we have towards the bottom of page three is this. The fundamental issue in this section is not baptism into Christ's death and resurrection per se, but baptism into Christ himself. You see, if you notice these words in Romans 6 very carefully, they say this. Uh, where have you got? Verse 3. Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Now, the particular wording and order of that's quite important. It says that the, the critical thing is, don't you know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ? That's, that's the critical thing. See, in Galatians chapter 3, it can say, as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. The, the essential thing that baptism does illustrate, at least from our understanding and exegesis of that, is baptism into Christ is, is baptism into union with the person of Jesus Christ. Now, <clears throat> that means being baptized into union with his, as I said before, his perfect righteousness, baptized into union with his death, certainly, into union with his burial, into a union with his resurrection, into union even with his exaltation. We are united, being baptized into Christ, united with Christ, we are united with him in all those facets. And to select, say, two or three, to say the mode of immersion is to represent two of the blessings of union with Christ, namely our burial with him and resurrection with him is limiting the blessings of being united with Christ just if you want to restrict it to those two things. So that's the kind of argument we would come back. Romans 6, 1 to 4 is not saying that our baptism into Christ is only into his burial and only into his death or his resurrection. Howbeit those things are true. But the fundamental idea is you're baptized into Christ. Don't you realize that means you were consequently baptized into his death, burial, and into his resurrection? Okay, so that, that's the particular force of the argument that's used here. Over the page, what have we got this? <clears throat> Our conclusion is that the main idea of baptism is that of purification, which water symbolizes, 
and which results from union with Christ. That's at the heart of what I've been trying to say tonight. Union with Christ brings us into union with his, all of his redemptive and mediatorial work, but it particularly brings us into union with certainly his death and with his burial, his resurrection, and the purification that is connected with those things. But Tom Wilkinson says, but there is no solid evidence for immersion as the practice of the New Testament church. Others might contest that. And much that tells against it, for us, not the mode, but the reality that baptism represents should have the proper attention, and that is too often absent from the concern of immersion. So the reality of union with Christ and cleansing in him. Well, I'm not sure if any of you want to raise any points at this uh, stage or not. Passing on quickly then just to pouring or sprinkling are also considered acceptable modes. Pouring is a fitting manner of representing the baptism with the spirit, the inner reality of the things symbolized in baptism. Sprinkling is a common mode of ceremonial cleansing in the Old Testament, and I've mentioned that. Wilkinson writes, since water baptism is the outer and visible sign of the inner reality that's given in the baptism of the spirit, it ought to be apparent that if pouring is adequate to describe that baptism, then the same should be true of water baptism, which is the outer symbol of the inner reality of the gift of the Holy Spirit. And McPherson says, the mode is rightly regarded as immaterial because not strictly determined by any express injunction. When this is granted, then the most convenient mode will be preferred as the more troublesome has nothing special to recommend it. In other words, there's no particular virtue in going to a lot of trouble to get a lot of water in a very barren land simply to baptize people by immersion. No particular virtue in that. All right, well, I am sure that until the Lord Jesus comes back, there will be a heated debate over this particular issue. Um, as I say, this is the position that our Reformed and Presbyterian churches do take. Baptism is important. It ought to be administered or not be neglected. It ought to be administered in the understanding that it does signify union with Christ and the cleansing and renewal that are connected with union with him. How precisely that is administered, there are differences of opinion. And uh, our, our heritage says the mode per se is not the critical issue. The spiritual significance is. Well, let's press on to look at the subject, which <clears throat> is the other area and perhaps even the more hotly contested our uh, reformed faith and uh, forebears have argued that not only those who actually profess faith in and obedience to Christ but also the infants of one or both believing parents are to be baptized this is the section that argues and affirms that Infant children of believing parents are to be baptized. Well, over the weeks, as I've sought to explain the covenantal concept of baptism or the sacraments, namely that these sacraments are not so much expressions of things we do, but they are signs that God appends and gives to his covenant promise, I've stressed that there is a Godward dimension of that. I think I've also stressed that in the covenant that was established with Abraham, which is fundamentally the covenant of promise and the covenant of grace, God gave a promise not simply to Abraham, but a promise that embraced his offspring also. I will be a God to you and to your children after you in their generations. And he not only gave the promise, but he gave that outward sign and seal of circumcision. And he said to Abraham, this sign and seal is to be administered not simply to you, the one that I have established this covenant with, but it is also to be administered to your offspring because they are embraced within the scope 
of that promise. Now, that is the underlying basis of the continual practice of covenant baptism in Peter Baptists. There is a, a commitment and an argument to the fact that the covenant of grace that we are saved by and under is still the covenant of promise given to Abraham. It was the gospel first enunciated in the Garden of Eden when God said that he would crush the seed of the serpent through the seed of the woman. But that promise of hope, salvation and deliverance was a clarified, elaborated and received formal covenantal expression in the covenant of promise given to Abraham. Same gospel, same promise of salvation. But in Abraham, it was affirmed to be the promise given. Now, Peter Baptists, Reformed Presbyterians, argue that that covenant which was established as an everlasting covenant contained in it God's commitment and promise to be a God also to the children of believers. And the covenant sign was to be administered to those male children who grew up as well. And we argue that there is still a fundamental continuity of that covenant promise. The outward administration may differ from the old Mosaic covenant to the new covenant in Christ Jesus, but the promise is the same. The covenant of grace is the same. And embedded in that covenant is God's promise that his electing sovereign grace is not going to be random, but it is going to run in the riverbed of families and the created generational succession that he, the creator God, has made. So we embrace that. And as in the old covenant, Children of believers were not only entitled to, but instructed to be included in that covenant community with a sign. We also embrace that and baptize our children in that same commitment of faith and belief. So that's the underlying theology or argument of this position. I'm not asking necessarily for you to, uh, whether you agree with that, but at least you must understand it. I think it is important today because, um, well, num number one, covenant baptism is, is rip rapidly becoming uh, extinct within the broader evangelical church. Secondly, those who practice it are almost instinctively presumed as simply being traditionalists who are doing it just to be chris have, have uh, the children christened or done. And there's little appreciation that behind this lies a rich, strong covenantal theology, which does not presume that the water of baptism regenerates our children, but it is a theology which recognizes that the God who saved us is the God who from the very beginning of the Abrahamic expression of his covenant grace, and even before that in his saving Noah and so on, indicated he's a God of families, a God who delights to redeem, to save, and to operate within the context of families. So, again, not to embrace Catherine uh, here with us, but... When Nola and I were blessed with the gift of children, we received our little children, as I'm sure Baptist families do as well. But we received our little children as a gift from God. We acknowledged he was the giver of this good gift. But we did more than that. We acknowledged also as we held those little children in our arms that God had made a covenantal claim to them and embrace them in a covenantal promise. And we, from the instant they breathe, said, Father, these are not only yours by creation, but they are yours also by your covenantal commitment of promise. And we also gladly submit them to the sign of your promised grace. And we had them baptized, and they were raised in a home, 
where, okay, it wasn't presumed that the Holy Spirit had regenerated them in the womb, it not presumed that the water of baptism had actually regenerated them, but nevertheless it was an atmosphere of faith where our children have never known a moment where there was any kind of sense of no man's land. That we are not inside, we are not outside, but we are kind of suspended from the very beginning our children have been raised conscious that God has embraced them within the community of his people. And they are to be raised and taught to fear, to love, to honor, and to serve the living God. Okay, so that is the kind of strong commitment of faith that is born out of the covenantal promise. At the same time, we know that Ishmael was circumcised and ended up in Arabia. We know that Esau was circumcised, and yet God did not embrace him as a child of promise. We know also that concerning Israel after the flesh, there were many who were of Israel, rightly and properly, marked out with circumcision as the descendants of Abraham. We recognize that not all of them were truly of Israel. But we recognize there's a difference between God's way of administering his household and God's eternal sovereign electing decree. If God says, this is the way I want my household to be administered, then we administer it that way. And don't try to second guess his sovereign electing purposes. Abraham didn't ask God, well, is Ishmael going to be included within the promised line? Didn't ask that, he just obeyed. Because that's God's way of administering his covenant and kingdom in the world. That's his visible administration or his administration with the visible church. Okay, so there's all sorts of questions come up in people's minds. And it's not an issue of trying to guess whether our children are elect or whether they're saved. We simply are fulfilling what we believe is God's order and God's command and his way of administering his household. So that's, that's basically what lies behind this practice and this commitment here. Not only those who profess faith in Christ, but the infants of one or both believing parents. Now... <clears throat> Time is running out on us, and I, I've got a couple of pages of notes that do relate to this. Let me just pick up on some of the main points, and then if you've got any questions here. You note under, on page four, they're under point two. Infants, so also are infants of one or both believing parents. The infant children of believing parents are to be baptized. This is the most hotly contested of issues relating to baptism. Grounds for this claim are founded ultimately on the unity in the Old and New Covenants, the absence of specific command to baptize in the New Testament does not necessarily exclude them. Given the old covenant inclusion of children in the covenant, it would call for a specific exclusion of them in the new if their status was to be changed. Corroborative evidence exists for their continuing inclusion in the privileges of covenant membership. Now, let me pause for a moment. I know that arguments from silence can be said to be non-arguments at all. But I want you to put this, I want you to try and, and I'm not trying to overdo this. I think that this is a very, very genuine thing. You're an, you're, you imagine you're an Israelite, okay? You're an earnest, faithful Israelite. And in keeping with the tradition of your fathers for the centuries, you have been waiting for the promised Messiah. And you have grown up generation after generation where children were circumcised, you were believed to be the people of God, and so on. So here you are. Let me say I am Andrew uh, Ben um, Enoch, or something or other. Andrew, son of Enoch, a fervent Jew. I've got my untrimmed beard and all the rest, and <clears throat> I've got red hair as well. Not sure that's the case, but here I am. I am there, I'm a man like Simeon, who was in the temple, and I'm a man like Zechariah, and I am waiting for the consolation of Israel, and I have behind me this 
enormously rich and wonderful Jewish heritage. And generation after generation after generation, the children have been born and my own children have been brought up and they are Jews, they're the people of God. They're marked out as the special people of God. And now suddenly John the Baptist comes and he's preaching about the one coming in the wilderness and then Jesus comes. And uh, my eyes are opened. I, I, I'm there on the day of Pentecost. And I hear Peter preaching. And I'm pricked in heart. And I'm suddenly convinced that this Jesus of Nazareth, who's been crucified, is, is Lord and he is Christ. He is Messiah. Jesus is the Messiah. And suddenly I'm crying out as well to Peter saying, what must I do? And, and Peter says, you've got to, to, to believe the gospel, you've got to repent, and you've got to be baptized. And you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, here I am, a good Jew who's been brought up in that rich culture, the solidarity of the family and community. Now, and I've recognized Jesus is our long-promised Messiah. Am I just going to be baptized myself? I think a Jew instinctively would have said, what about my household? What about my household? Surely wouldn't they too have been included? Now, I think a pious Jew, hard for, we're an individualistic society. We think of individuals. Guarantee a Jew wouldn't have done that. Guarantee a pious Jew wouldn't have thought of himself only. And that's why I think it gives real weight to Peter's words. It says, be baptized and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for it's not only unto you but unto your children and unto as many that are far off, even as many as believe. I think those believing Jews would have understood that the promise of the Holy Spirit being given to the Messianic community would have been embraced by their children, would have been a promise for their children, living children. Anyway, that might not be that convincing to you, but the more I understand the spirit of the Old Testament and the spirit of the solidarity of the home and of the hope, I think that there is force in the argument which says it's not a matter, an issue of whether those first Jewish converts were allowed to have their children baptized. It would have required something pretty explicit to forbid their households being included also in this messianic blessing. Well, that may not carry much weight to you. Only the Spirit of God can, and I'm not, not saying this arrogantly, I might be deluded, but uh, I know that uh, it's not for me to try and, and wrongly convince that kind of thing. But that is something we've got to try and put ourselves back into that situation, not read it from our position today. But put yourself back in the household of Simon or of Zechariah, or of some other fervent, earnest, believing Jew. And uh, I think that the whole notion would not have been individualistic one by one, inclusion in the new messianic community, but the, um, the whole of households. And that, I think, is part of, the, the, that does give added force to the fact, as you see here, that three of the 12 instances of baptisms in the New Testament relate to households. Down below, Peter's speech on the day of Pentecost also includes children. Over the page, page 5, Jesus referred to the children of members of the covenant being themselves members of the kingdom and saying that of such is the kingdom of heaven. Wilkinson states, we are not to understand Jesus to mean adults who in certain respects resemble these children, either in their faith or their humility. Now, I wish I had time to... Explore this further. It's a common understanding that when Jesus, you remember that instance, Jesus is teaching and preaching. Parents are bringing children. Luke tells us they were babes. They were not, this, they were children in arms, that kind of thing. They were babies being brought to Jesus. And the disciples were basically shooing these mothers of Israel and perhaps fathers of Israel away, saying, the master's too busy. Don't bother him now. And Jesus rebukes them sternly. And it's important to see. He wasn't just, no, 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 it's quite okay. I know I'm on the phone now, but 
<coughs> no, Jesus rebuked them sternly. He was angered in his heart over the shooing away of these children. And he says, the reason why, he says, because of such is the kingdom of God. To them, forbid them not. For of such is the kingdom. Now, I know that people want to say, well, he's referring to the fact that it is people who are childlike in spirit are of the kingdom. Doesn't make sense. He's not saying, don't you shoo them away because these are symbols of the true characters of the kingdom. No, no, no way at all. These children belong to the kingdom. And he embraced them and blessed them. That's a pretty significant, pretty important passage. And uh, yeah, that's, that's again one of the corroborative evidences here we've got to have a look at. Paul also did recognize a distinction between children of believers and those of unbelievers. 1 Corinthians 7, that passage where he speaks about children being holy. Um, okay, well... I'll leave you to read the rest of that because we've only got a few minutes left. The last section, couple of sections we need to look at are the hardest. They are ones which I haven't deliberately left till the end because I want to dodge them, although I do to some degree want to dodge one section because it's a bit difficult. But I'm not explicitly trying to do that. This, this particular section is looking at baptism and saving grace. And it makes the contention, right at the top here it says, although it is a great sin to despise or neglect baptism. It is a sin to despise or neglect it. You cannot look at the way in the Old Testament God deals with those who fail to circumcise children without realizing there's something pretty significant here. In Genesis 17, when God gives the ordinance of circumcision to Abraham, you remember he does make that comment. He says, look, if anyone fails to circumcise their offspring, they have what? They have broken my covenant. He doesn't just say, you've omitted an optional extra that doesn't really mean very much. He says, you have broken my covenant and the uncircumcised child was to be what? Excluded. They are outside Israel, cut off from the people. And then you've got the instance in Exodus 4 when Moses is on his way down to Egypt after God had met him at the mount. He's on his way down there to deliver Israel out of Egypt. And yet on the way, in the state of men, an angel of the and then an angel of the Lord meets Moses, is going to kill him. And Zipporah, his wife, takes a sharp bit of flint, circumcises the, skin, the, 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 the two sons, casts the foreskins at his feet and says, you're a man of bloods to me. Uh, evidently, the uncircumcised, remember Zipporah, was a wilderness. She was a shepherdess. Uh, Jethro was a prince of... Sorry? Midian, that's right, a Midianite prince. So perhaps because of that mixed marriage, Moses hadn't circumcised his children. But as he begins this specific redemptive errand, it's essential that his sons are circumcised. So I don't think we can read that kind of thing just saying the ordinances were just ho-hum to God. They were very significant. So although it is a sin, yet... Grace and salvation are not so inseparably connected with it that no person can be regenerated or saved without it, or that all who are baptized are undoubtedly regenerated. So here the confession of faith is wanting to argue against baptismal regeneration or connecting regenerating grace with the ordinance of baptism. And it's wanting to guard against two extremes. One, baptismal regeneration which says that baptism per se, grace and baptism are so connected together that the instant you're baptized, you're automatically regenerated. But it's also wanting to guard against the other and the assumption 
that all who are, oh, sorry, this is the one here. The assumption that all who are baptized are undoubtedly regenerated. Simon Magus apparently was still in the gall of bitterness, even though he'd been baptized. Remember, he was that Samaritan black magician. And uh, so the fact you're baptized is no guarantee you've been regenerated. Uh, and, but up here as well, they are not so inseparably connected that no person can be regenerated or saved without being baptized. Saying to Fulani before, the great example in that regard is that thief on the cross beside Jesus. Not baptized and yet evidently going to be in paradise with Jesus. So that's guarding here, baptism and salvation. Baptism is important, but yet it's not essential for salvation. And it is no guarantee of salvation. Just because you've been baptized, there's no insurance of it. And this last thing, this is the part that's particularly uh, difficult here, at least I think it is. The commentators on it tend to be a bit vague. It says this, the efficacy of baptism is not tied to the moment of time. Basically wanting to say baptism is not just an empty sign. It's not just a memorial thing. God's grace is connected with it in some way or other. However, the grace symbolized in baptism does not necessarily become effective. At the, it's not tied to the moment of time in which it's administered. Yet notwithstanding by the right use of this ordinance, the grace promised is not offered, but is also really exhibited and conferred. This is the, 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 the matter here. Conferred by the Holy Spirit to those, whether of age or infants, to whom the grace belongs, according to the counsel of God's own will in his own appointed time. Do you wish we had time to look at this a little bit more fully? Basically saying, look, Baptism is not just an empty sign and does signify a grace. And God is pleased that when people are regenerated, it is the fulfillment of the meaning of the sign of baptism. But he's just simply saying it is not tied to that exact moment of the administration of baptism. The grace represented in baptism is not necessarily conveyed at that time. All the elect that God has appointed to be regenerated will be regenerated, but at his time. And in that sense will fulfill the true significance and meaning of baptism. So that's the critical thing. It's not conferred to that particular time. And the last thing is the sacrament of baptism is to be administered only once to any person. That position is understood in connection with the fact that it is a symbol of regeneration and grafting into Christ, admission into the household of God. And those things only take place once. Just as circumcision, it's spiritually equivalent, and I know there's big arguments as to whether baptism's the counterpart of circumcision or not. I think its spiritual significance is the same. And that was ever only administered once. So it's appropriate that baptism only be administered once. Okay, we must finish because our people online have had their two hours. Okay, what we've looked at tonight then is one of these sacraments, baptism. It's got a rich, rich significance connected with the gospel. It is administered to people not simply to mark their inclusion in the church, but also to symbolize and represent the blessings of the covenant grace they have in and through union with Jesus Christ. It's properly administered not simply to believers, but according to Reformed theology, also to the offspring, the infant offspring of both or one believer. 1 Corinthians 7 indicates that even one believer sanctifies the children, the offspring within the marriage. All right? So that's basically what we've looked at. Important subject, deep subject, rich subject. Let's bow in prayer as we close. Heavenly Father, <clears throat> we're conscious there's been so much powder and shot and energy and emotion over this issue of baptism that's often clouded the rich reality that it symbolizes. And as we pass tonight, we just want to thank you again with all our hearts.
that you have given this visible symbol to confirm, to demonstrate and confirm that those in Christ Jesus are washed, cleansed, and renewed. We thank you for that with all our heart, that though our sins be as scarlet and as crimson, they are like wool and snow. And though our hearts were by nature obdurate and as hard as the hardest flint and stone, yet through the Holy Spirit's renewing activity, they've been made alive in Christ. And we thank you for that in his name. Amen. Okay, well, thanks everyone for your patience, and I hope that was of some interest and value. Uh, thanks Ernie and uh, Ben and Alan. Blessings. Oh, a reminder about the priest call.